92.1 WROI, WROIFM.com, streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5. And we're going to have audio and soon-to-be video as well on RTC Channel 4. That's why we have Dakota in the studio this morning. Welcome back. Thanks. Hey, nice to have you here again. Oh, nice to stay here. <laughs> he's going to be at a payroll for the day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He, he's got it. That's right. He's it says here. Desk, got him yeah. all set up, ready to go. John Alley with us, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Thanks Good for morning. being here. Trustees in session yesterday. Had, had our board meeting yesterday and uh, went through not a lot of major things, but a lot of little things. Okay. So, uh, you know, I've got a, I got a pretty good sized list today. I'm Usually ready. I only have one or two items. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we're preparing uh, head Dr. Hayes, who's been on sitting on the board as an advisory, a uh, medical staff advisory person. And we just kind of recognized him for all his years of service. He is going to be retiring Friday. It's coming up very quickly. And uh, we're going to have an open house scheduled in Argus at his clinic up there, four to six uh, this Friday. Uh, so, you know, stop by, tell him hi, and thanks for all of his years of service. And, you know, it's been one of those, he's been a great sounding board for me. Uh, years of experience in the community, in the hospital, and sometimes I'd come up with what I thought was a really good idea, and he had a very polite way of telling me <laughs> it wasn't a good idea. So I appreciate it. Though. I learned a lot from him and just history of the organization because, to me, the history predicts your future. Sure. And I was able to sit down and, you know, kind of just listen to him as he gave me a history of Woodlawn, and it really helped me as we look to expand and move forward. So Very respected doctor. Very respected. Going yeah. to miss him. Uh, exactly. You know, he's a valuable asset to the organization, and we're going to, it's going to be hard shoes to fill. Sure. Absolutely. One of the things we talked about a little bit coming up for next year, making some changes to our health insurance for our employees. It's one of those, again, that's a major recruiting tool as you look to bring in new staff. So we're kind of tweaking our plan a little bit, and uh, pretty well what we've determined with uh, these changes should save the employees a lot of money if they come and use Woodlawn Hospital. We'd like to redirect those back to our facility. We can control Makes those sense. costs a little sure. better than if we're paying somebody else. So those changes are going to affect uh, early next year, January 1. Coming probably October, we'll have what's called open enrollment, where everybody will come in and we'll be able to sit down and explain how those changes are how it's going to affect them long-term as we look to 2019. Do you use just one provider? No. Uh, okay. Basically, we've got, uh, uh, like anybody else, we've got uh, contracts, so to speak, with an insurance company. So we have two different plans that are in network with multiple facilities across the state and in our area. So the employees have that. If it's something that we can't do at our facility and they need to go somewhere else, we've got, you know, with our insurance plan, we can have them covered under insurance as they go to these other facilities. Excellent. And, uh, you know, as we're talking about retirements, uh, Cheryl Musselman, who's been at the hospital for a long time, uh, finally gave us a date. She's kept saying, well, I'm going to retire close to the end of the year. <laughs> uh, finally got a date hour, so December 14th is going to be her last day. And uh, Cheryl's just been a fairly major factor in improving the patient care areas at Woodlawn. And much like Dr. Hayes, could be missed. And, uh, you know, she was there when I came there. And, again, a nice sounding board for me to history of the organization and as we move forward. Um, so... Paula McKinney, uh, we've already got her hired and in place, so going to be one of those nice, smooth transitions where, not, you know, it's not like Paula comes in on a Monday and that's first day there. She's going to have a lot of time to spend with Cheryl to kind of make that transition from one person to the other, learn the organization and what that job really is, because there's a, a lot of people think that the administrative folks, we just kind of sit around all day and don't <laughs> do a lot, and uh, be surprised how much, you know, day-to-day -day activity we get that, you know, that's kind of behind the scenes. People don't see what's going on. So it's going to be nice to have Paula there and Cheryl help her walk through some of that uh, areas that she needs to be responsible for. As you for. and I were talking before we went on the air, a lot of detail to it, isn't it? A lot it? of detail right. to it, and the bad part, whatever we do today, it changes tomorrow. Right. And uh, so you're not only trying to work today you're trying to plan for tomorrow and we know there's new things coming in the future and you, know, you get the crystal ball out and you try to predict <laughs> what's it going to be so when that change comes we're ready and we're not trying to catch up but we're kind of ahead of that curve so uh, it's a lot of planning a lot of uh, looking at trends you know midwest here we start watching what's happening on the east and west coast because it kind of moves to the middle and so we're trying to track that and just keep ahead of that curve so okay. uh, again cheryl's gonna be missed Paula has got some big shoes to fill. She's got a, you know, she actually has a doctorate in nursing. So I think we've got a lot of resources with her. She's got a lot of experience in various organizations. And that's what we need, that outside look, 
bring new ideas, new concepts to the organization to help us grow. She obviously has a lot of experience then. A lot of experience. Okay. And that's that's the key there is that at that position, you've got to have that person who's very well-rounded in all different aspects of healthcare because, you know, all the nursing folks in the clinical areas report to them. So, again, exciting bringing her on board as we look to make that transition, make us a better organization as, you know, I like her. She asked, well, why are you doing it that way? <laughs> and I love that type of a- sure. attitude because there's a better way to do everything we do in that building. We just don't know what it is yet. Right. And by bringing in different points of view, different uh, people, ideas, opens up us to say, let's try a better way. So uh, it's exciting times. It kind of refreshes everybody, I think, that, you know, we're kind of used to, well, we've always done it that way. <laughs> Get us out of that rut. Let's look at new ways, better ways to do things. You sound like a radio station. Sounds like a radio station, <laughs> yes. Uh, also introduced Dr. Blaza to the board yesterday. He started on September 4th. He's uh, the new general surgeon that we brought on board and uh, is accepting new patients. So, you know, if you have a surgical air concern, contact Dr. Blazer or Dr. Nile. He's still with us. But it was just to the point, uh, you know, Dr. Nile was, we were working him too hard. Uh you know, you're going to work so many hours, and we absolutely needed somebody to help him with his practice. Dr. Blazer steps right in uh, day one. He's been busy from the first day. In fact, he commented yesterday. He said, you didn't tell me I was going to be that busy to start <laughs> with, So, which is a good thing. You know, that, that gets them jump-started on their practice here in town as we move forward. So, a great addition to our staff. Good. Uh, the other thing, <clears throat> October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yeah, so, ladies, right. check with your health care provider. See if it's time for your mammogram. Um, never had it done. I understand it's slightly uncomfortable, but consider the consequences. So get with your uh, health care provider. If you're in that group that you know should have an annual mammogram, absolutely get it scheduled. Not with Woodlawn, with somebody. Uh, it is a life-saving event that you need to do. Get it done. It, uh, October kind of brings that to the forefront. And we were just discussing uh, part of our health insurance plan at, the, at today's leadership meeting. And when we look at our own staff, uh, when we looked at those folks who were in that window that should get an annual mammogram, only 11% of our own employees are doing it. So we've got to educate our staff, too. You know, this is something that's very important. Breast uh, Cancer Awareness Month, get your mammogram if you're in that group that uh, should be have one on an annual basis. Okay. Along with breast cancer, guess what season we're in? Flu season. Flu season. Flu That's right. Season. That's so, right. You know, uh, you really need to be thinking about getting your flu shot. Do you uh, have the vaccine? We have it in. Okay. And we've already started our staff. Okay. Um, you know, our big day, we want to have everything done by about mid to late October. But we've already started getting staff members. If you want to get your flu shot, you get with our employee health nurse, get it going. It's, uh, you know, it's never too soon, basically. Um, you know, CDC recommends that uh, you get that by the end of October. Get in it later, you know can be beneficial but definitely try to get it in before the end of october because that's when kind of we seem like the magic season starts right after october john some people would say well the flu vaccine didn't seem to work very well last year it did not work well last right. year and uh you know it's, it's best you can say it's a guessing game on those folks who sure. make, they get with cdc and say what are the probabilities there's you know countless numbers of different variations of the flu what they try to determine is what is probably going to be the top four or five that we might see and that's what that vaccine covers so they they create it to cover that top four or five they missed it last year we're hoping this year that you know they're a little closer to that but again when you consider the number of variations of the flu that's out there it's just they look at probabilities and statistics to try to determine which variant that they need put in the vaccine. So we're hoping that we see a, a much closer match to the vaccine to what we actually see in the flu season this year. Okay. Uh, those children who need two doses uh, to be protected should start that sooner than later because you have to wait uh, at least four weeks between the two two vaccines. So, you know, again, get with your health care provider, get that done. Um like uh, we're talking about vaccine contains, you know, three or four of the best matched that, that they're guessing at. So, again, uh, it's not just one strains in there. They have multiple strains in there. Uh, good health. Here's the, the tip from our health nurse. Okay. Good health habits during flu season. And she bolded these. So these are important. <laughs> Avoid close contact with those who are sick. So if you know somebody's sick, stay away from right. them. If you are stick, s- sick, stay home. Don't go out everywhere because all you're doing is spreading that virus. Cover your mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing. Clean your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. 
and then clean surfaces frequently if you you know somebody in your house has the flu a lot of common sense stuff. a lot there. of common yeah. sense you know it, and it is virus so there's nothing really we can do about it you can try the vaccine but once you get it you've got it right there are medicines out there that will maybe relieve some of the symptoms but uh, there's not a cure for it so you know when you get the, that stuffy nose and the cough just assume i'm probably early early flu. pretty much going to run the course it's going to run its course you know wash your hands a lot cover your mouth um avoid contact you know right and you know grandma and grandpa don't go see the grandkids yeah, exactly. when you got that uh, you know don't expose them to that so exactly. just use some common sense uh, it is starting there is a, a variant we've seen in northern indiana it's starting to work its way south so we've got even you know some folks now with that you know they're calling it the crud you know the stuffy nose the hacking cough you know that's just part of that early flu that's starting so just be aware it's starting get with your health care provider and get your flu shot get okay. it early and uh, get that prevention built up as we go us more senior members of the community. Uh, why, why do you look at me when you say that? Well, it's, you know, I, I was just uh, looking out for our listeners. I, I, see. I had to look somewhere. I understand. Uh, you know, and I'm in that group too. Uh, if you're, you know, 65 and older, there is a, a different vaccine because, you know, our system is not as good as the, the younger folks. So there's a little stronger dose of the flu vaccine that they can give to those, uh, you know, us. Again, of the more senior, a okay. wiser nature. So, again, get with your health care provider. Let them know, yeah, want my flu shot. And, uh, you know, if you're a little more senior, you might get a little higher dose. It uh, doesn't mean that it's going to make you sick. It's just our immune systems are a little less protective now that we get older than they are when, when we're younger. Makes sense. And see, we finally got in then to uh, into the financials. Okay. Uh, for the month of August, we had gross revenue just a little bit over $13 million. Our deductions was about eight point two million. Again, staying in that about sixty percent range, so that gives us uh, what I call our money to spend about four point nine. Uh, had uh, operating expenses about four point nine, so we did have a small profit for the month about two hundred seventy five thousand. Okay. So again, we're starting to see that turn, you know, more away from the losses into the more of the blacks uh, months that we have moved to the year end. And then the, one of the final things that we kind of talked about a little bit is our, our swing bed program. We've always had that program available where if you've been discharged from an acute care setting, either at Woodlawn or another hospital, but you need that little bit of extended care. Uh, a lot of times folks are going to nursing homes for two to three weeks. You know, we've now opened up our program and that instead of going to a nursing home now for that two to three, four week period, if you meet qualifications, you can come to Woodlawn and it's just you have a lot of freedoms. It's not like, you know, you're a typical inpatient. Uh, we get you up, we get you moving around, just help you over that hump so okay. that you can get home, uh, you know, on your road to recovery. So, uh, we just had a, a person called us yesterday from Ball Memorial Hospital. Let's go come up and go into our swing bag program because they're from this area. So okay. that's nice. That we're starting to see folks wanting to come back to us, get in the swing bag program. Again, if you think you qualify, talk to your healthcare professional or even call our, you know, the nursing staff and say, what is the criteria for a swing bed? Because there are certain things you have to be able to do. And, and you know, it's not like you can just kind of come and stay in bed. We're going to keep you active because the, the idea is to get you acclimated back up on your feet so you can go home. So that uh, we've started that program and uh, seen a, a fairly marketed increase in folks interested in coming to Woodlawn or staying at Woodlawn for that swing bed program to get them home sooner after either a surgical event. A lot of times it's orthopedic surgeries where you're just not quite ready to go home yet, but they kick you out of the hospital. Your insurance says you can't stay anymore. This program is designed for that. That Again, that two weeks, maybe just a little longer stay. Will the insurance pick that up? Insurance picks okay, that up. Uh, therapy comes up. You know, we get you, you know, basically in a swing bag program, if you're an inpatient, therapy comes to your room. As a swing bed, we want you to go to therapy. Again, we got to get you up, make you mobile, get you used to moving around so that program is picking up and uh you know it's just a nice addition to the community that now we can offer that whereas before we were a little hesitant to do that because we didn't want to use those rooms in case we had you know acute care patients you know with some of the more folks going home much earlier now or even not even coming to the hospital we do have like four or five beds now that we've got to designate kind of that swing bag program so you can do your recovery locally not have to go somewhere else John, you mentioned the financials for Woodlawn Hospital. How are we doing for the first nine months of the year? How are we doing through the first three quarters? Uh, we've got a year-to-date profit uh, at the end of August. September's, uh, you know, we haven't, 
assuming we're going to have a profit right. for September also. Right. But again, usually the losses we sustain early in the year, we start making up in the late in the year. And, uh, you know, because, again, we get into flu season, and if you've got a compromised immune system, usually that results in a hospital stay just to make sure that you get through that flu episode. So we see some of that starting to come now, uh, some respiratory issues as we get into the colder weather. And, you know, we even got some folks now, once we're picking the crops, you don't, you know, you don't realize, but there's a lot of dust and stuff gets in the air. Exactly. So if you've got a little bit of a respiratory issue, that aggravates it. So we're starting to see some folks coming in for respiratory issues just from all the corn and bean dust from when they're combining. Um, and, you know, you go outside and look at dust. You know, you can actually see the dust in the air. Well, right. if you've got a compromised uh, lung system, that gets in there. So uh, we're here to take care of those folks. John Alex, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital here in Rochester, and uh, brings up to date on the trustees' meeting yesterday. Did that pretty well cover the meeting? That pretty well covered the meeting, okay. yes. We have a question from a listener this morning okay. I want to pass along to Great. You. So several news stories in the last couple of weeks uh, have been out there about the cost of helicopter ambulance bills, and they're interested in who sets the price for that medical helicopter ambulance ride. That would be the, the helicopter itself. Whoever okay. owns that copter, whoever owns that service, sets that price based on their operating cost. And, you know, I've fortunately, I've never had to use it, but I've talked to some folks, and it is very expensive. But when you realize that's usually used for a reason, right. uh, you know, we need, or if you're in a car accident and it's determined not the scene, the paramedics who are there, this patient needs to get to a tertiary care center very quickly. That's when they utilize that ambulance. There are even, you know, protocols within the state now that the state trauma folks have set together that says, if you come up upon an accident as an EMS provider and these things have happened, you probably need to fly that patient because there's trauma there that you're not going to readily see on the out. We've got some internal injuries. And the faster we can get you to that tertiary care center, to that trauma center, the higher probability of, one, you surviving that in, and, two, getting you know, the care you need. So it's usually provided they set that rate based upon their operating costs. Um, and it is very expensive. But when you get down to it, you know, sometimes that's the difference, that air transport difference between life and death. Uh, you know, we fly a lot of folks with uh, cardiac conditions because, you know, time is heart. And if you've come in with a stroke or if you're having a, you know, a heart attack, the longer it takes to get you to that care center where they can do the either the bypass or do the stent, the more damage is being done to that heart. So the key is how fast can I get that person from point A to that center where they need to be. And sometimes that air ambulance absolutely is the fastest way to get them there. And it's just not, uh, like I say, it's just not everybody does it. There are criteria. You know, do we want to fly this patient? And, uh, you know, they, they go through an algorithm that says, a if A happens, we do B. If B happens, we do okay. C. And if it goes through that and it says air ambulance, that's probably the best way for you to get there to make sure you're going to survive that event. Insurance cover that? I think insurance covers... A portion of okay. it. I don't, I, okay. you know, I did, and again, it depends on your policy. Sure does. What insurance sure you does. have. Sure does. I know it covers part of it, but again, it is an expensive service, uh, but absolutely worthwhile. And, uh, you know, I think it's a very valuable service. We're lucky in our area to have that uh, yes, area are. set at yes, the airport. Yes, we are. Uh, you know, we have very quick access to that. Yes, it's not do. having to fly from, you know, Fort Wayne or Indianapolis or someplace else to get here. So when, you know, that we call them, I know from the hospital perspective, patient will hit the door. The physician will do that very quick triage and he'll call, see if the, get the helicopter on standby. Doesn't mean we're going to use it, but now we've got into that queue. We get the first call because we've already, you know, I guess we call dibs on the helicopter. Right. And so they're waiting. And, uh, you know, then once we determine yes or no, then we call back, say flight's confirmed. We've got the flight crew at the hospital. We've got you loaded over to the helicopter and on your way. And if it's determined, nope, we're not going to need the helicopter. We just, you know, call and we'll cancel that. But it's such an asset having them located at the Fulton County Airport, very close to us. And, uh, you know, they've done uh, what's called scene pickups where there's been a serious car accident, maybe out on 31. They'll actually fly the helicopter to the to the scene, pick up the patient and transport them. So very, very valuable asset. Um it's expensive, but you know it's just it's used when it's absolutely necessary. Very competent folks. Doing Very competent that too. folks on there. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Again, John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, and uh, last question: Any discussion about room renovations? Because I know you and I have talked about that for the last couple of months. 
Yes, that's that is still going forward. Okay. Again, what we're wanting to do when we do it, we want to make sure we're doing it right. So we're not going to rush into this. Um, you know, we're talking with the architects, and you know, uh, we're still to that point. Do we want to reduce the number of rooms? And so we're doing that, going back and okay. doing a, a retro look at how many times have we been at 15 or 17 or 18 rooms and trying to plot that out and then predict again that crystal ball i'm looking to that future you know do we think we're going to need all those rooms as we move five years down the road and with some of the changes that we're seeing that's coming in healthcare delivery you know again that home model is something that's been looked at whereas i don't put you in the hospital i admit you to your home and we go there. Right. We'll come see you. Insurance companies have found that's a, a much lower cost setting to put in. And they're seeing comparable outcomes on certain, you know, disease management. So are we going to see that in this area? Not next year, but about within two to three years. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to start seeing now. I won't be admitted to the hospital anymore. I will be admitted to my home and we'll take the services to you. And uh, so that's what we got to prepare for. How's that going to change the demographics and the dynamics of what we do now? How you know do I prepare for that? So my gut tells me as we move to the future, we're going to need less inpatient rooms. So now I can take the rooms we have, mm-hmm. make them bigger, a little more comfortable for those. Mm-hmm. When we do have an inpatient, that room's a little bigger. So uh, again, not wanting to rush into it, and it's you know. It's kind of one of those, whatever decision you make, you know probably in six years it's going to be wrong, but you just got to do it anyway and, and move forward. So that is still moving forward, moving slowly. We want to do it right when we do it. John Alley, President and CEO, CEO, Woodlawn Hospital. Thank you for your time this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing the information with the listeners, and thanks for keeping us all healthy. Hey, my pleasure. Our, right. our job is to put ourselves out of business. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's times when I wonder if we're doing too good a job, you know, when we start looking at some of the financials. But again, long term, you know, we got to, you know, peep, People need to be healthy, and we've got to promote that, help them keep healthy. And uh, I, it would be wonderful someday we can say we don't need health care anymore, but never going to happen. Nope. That's kind of what we work toward. Our job is to put ourselves out of business. So uh, we try to do that. John Alley, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.